Life isn't fair, but it's unlikely the hardships of your life could measure up to the misfortune that abounded in the life of Joe Arity. Everyday struggles became trivial in comparison to his fate. After all, what could be more unfair than execution for a crime you didn't commit? In this edition of Simple Infographic, we'll talk about someone whose real-life tragedy mirrors the plot of Stephen King's The Green Mile. Young Joe was born on April 29, 1915, in the American city of Pueblo, Colorado. His parents, Mary and Henry, moved to the USA from Syria in search of work and a better future. In 1909, the Arity family wound up in Colorado. Joe was their first child. His father found work at a Colorado fuel and ironworks steel mill, which earned the family a small house. As Joe grew up, he was at first no different from other children. But a few years on, there came a cause for concern. When the boy turned five years old, he still couldn't speak. Despite this abnormality, in 1921, his parents enrolled Joe in the local Bessemer Elementary School. There, the boy studied, with much difficulty, for one year. Before the start of his second school year, the school principal contacted Joe's parents. He informed them of Joe's developmental difficulties and said that it would be better for him to stay home. The family's poverty prevented them from organizing homeschooling. So, for the next three years, from 1922 to 1925, Joe was left on his own. He had no interaction with other children. Most of his time was spent alone, playing with whatever he found and wandering around. Then, in 1923, Henry and Mary had a second son, and a year later, a daughter. His mother's responsibilities increased, and she couldn't provide much attention to her oldest son. Trying to feed his large family, Henry Arity quit the factory and went into bootlegging, the underground sale of alcohol. Because of his new occupation, Henry regularly spent time in prison and couldn't spend very much time with his wife and kids. On the advice of neighbors, the head of the family petitioned the Pueblo District Court, in 1925, the court ordered that Joe be sent to the Colorado State Home and Training School for Mental Defectives. The educational institution was located almost 500 kilometers from Pueblo, in the city of Grand Junction. Medical examination showed that Joe's IQ was 46, corresponding with a six-year-old's level of mental development. At 10 years old, Joe could barely read or write, understand numbers, or distinguish between shapes and colors. In speech, he mainly used short phrases consisting of two or three words. Additionally, the boy was very shy and passive. All of this was enough to diagnose him as an imbecile. However, Joe's time in the special school was brief. His father was tortured with his conscience. He believed that he had gotten rid of his son, and after nine months, decided to bring him back home. At the end of summer in 1926, Joe moved back home. The child once again found himself left on his own. During the ages of 11 to 13, Joe still spent his time playing games for small children and aimlessly walking. He never presented any kind of threat to other people, remaining passive and shy. But as it turned out, society did present a threat to him. In 1929, when Joe was 14 years old, an event occurred that would significantly affect his fate. The young boy was wandering around Pueblo when a group of local teenagers surrounded him. Having cornered Joe, the teenagers began to taunt him and force him into sexual acts. Joe was unable to defend himself. At that time, a probation officer, someone who would monitor parolees and those who had spent time in special institutions, was nearby. Seeing what was going on, he dispersed the teenagers and immediately sent a letter to the Grand Junction School. The officer insisted that Joe required supervision by specialists. Some sources claim that in writing the letter, the officer switched around some of the facts. He wrote extensively about the danger to society posed by the boy and blamed Joe for the incident. As a result, the mentally disabled youth once again found himself in Grand Junction, and his personal file was marked with a note about sexual deviation. He spent seven years there from 1929 to 1936. The majority of Joe's time was spent in his room. The specialists didn't consider his condition stable enough, so he wasn't allowed into lessons or on trips to the farm. Later, Joe, who was already 20 years old, began to help in the kitchen, performing simple tasks. All this time, the young man underwent various examinations. The results of one of his medical examinations were noteworthy. Despite his biological age, Joe showed no interest in the opposite sex or in the topic of sexual relations in general. Railroad tracks passed nearby the school. The Great Depression that erupted in the 1930s led people to try any possible means to get to another city and find work. They would grab onto the passing trains. All of these scenes played out in front of the eyes of the patients, and some of them began to have thoughts of escape. Joe was one of those who decided to run away. On August 9, 1936, 
he and three other patients of the special institution got to the railway station and sneaked onto a train headed for Pueblo. Upon arriving in Pueblo, the three others walked around the city while Joe stayed to wander around near the train station. When the men returned, they found Arity and headed back to Grand Junction together, but Joe disappeared on the way back. On August 12th, he separated himself from the others and wandered somewhere for a whole week. It can be assumed that Arity traveled around nearby towns until August 20th when he was spotted at the Cheyenne Railway Station in the neighboring state of Wyoming. Here, in search of food and shelter, he came across a special kitchen car which served the workers of the United Pacific Railway Company. The kitchen managers, the Gibson family, hired Joe on as a dishwasher, promising to feed him in exchange. But after a week, on August 26th, 1936, the railway kitchen had to move on. The young man couldn't go with him because he wasn't officially an employee. Thus, Joe once again found himself at the Cheyenne Station, where on that same day he was arrested by police for vagrancy. While Joe was lost somewhere, Pueblo experienced a brutal murder. On the evening of August 15, 1936, a 15-year-old girl, Dorothy Drain, was raped and murdered in her own home. Her 12-year-old sister, Barbara, was also injured in the attack and fell into a coma from a blow to the head. The girls were discovered by their parents who were returning from a charity ball. The city was shocked. The citizens were also fearful due to a previous murder on August 2nd committed just a few blocks from the Drain family home and very similar in nature. The previous victim was 72-year-old Sally Crumpley. Her niece, Mrs. McMurtry, was also hit on the head with an ax but survived. The killer's method in the two cases was very similar. The killing of Dorothy Drain became one of the biggest cases for the police in Colorado and neighboring states. Consequently, when Joe Arity wound up in the hands of the police and said that he was from Pueblo, he immediately fell under suspicion. But in Pueblo itself, the investigation also moved along. On August 20th, the police noticed a suspicious man at Dorothy's funeral. It was Frank Aguilar, who previously worked for the girl's father. Soon, clues were revealed that indicated his guilt. An ax which had been used to strike blows was found in Aguilar's home, and the surviving Barbara identified Frank as the attacker. It seemed that the crime was solved. But Sheriff George Carroll of Cheyenne was too eager to distinguish himself and insert his name into the story of the high-profile case. Carroll told Pueblo police that the man detained in Cheyenne had confessed to the girl's murder. The investigation became confused. In Pueblo, the police held Aguilar, to whom all evidence pointed, but they couldn't get a confession out of him. And in Cheyenne, Carroll claimed that the other man had admitted to the crime in pursuit of personal gain. George Carroll even rushed to report information to local media and give an interview to the Pueblo Chieftain magazine. Not understanding anything, Joe Arity was a very convenient suspect. During the interrogation, Carroll asked leading questions and got the necessary information out of him. Carroll's version was also supported by Arity's personal file in the Grand Junction School, which mentioned his sexual deviances. There were clear inconsistencies in Joe's testimony. Several times he told different versions of the killing. Despite this, Carroll insisted that he had apprehended the killer and not a helpless mentally disabled person. The question of the actual killer, Frank Aguilar, was decided quickly. The jury found him guilty, and in August of 1937, he was executed in a gas chamber. But Joe Arity was still not released. Barbara, the main witness to the crime, never mentioned the involvement of a second man. But despite her testimony, the trial went with the other version. During an interrogation, a confession was coaxed out of Joe that he was at the house together with a man named Frank. Lawyer Fred Bernard, assigned to defend Joe Arity, did everything in his power to get his client acquitted. In large part thanks to him in February of 1937, a trial began to determine Joe's sanity. Three psychiatrists gave identical conclusions. The defendant was insane and had the mind of a six-year-old child. However, George Carroll insisted and on the strength of the sheriff's good reputation, he was believed. In the final meeting of the trial, the jury took three and a half hours to make their decision. Despite the results of the psychiatric experts and the lack of eyewitness testimony or direct evidence, Joe was found sane and guilty and sentenced to death. Joe was sent to prison in Canyon City to await his fate. At first, his execution was scheduled for October 16, 1937. Thanks to the intervention of prison warden Roy Best and Denver attorney Gail Ireland, who took an interest in the case, Joe was able to get a total of nine deferrals. But in the end, all of his appeals were rejected. For the entire year and a half of his imprisonment, Joe never realized what awaited him. Most of the prisoner's time was spent pushing his toy train around his cell. Sometimes he would read children's books given to him by Warden Best, or make faces at his reflection in a tin plate. 
Even the most hardened criminals awaiting execution were enamored by him in that prison. In an interview permitted by Roy Best in 1938, Joe said that he didn't want to return home or to school, where he was often picked on. In his words, here in prison, alongside Warden Best, he had found true happiness. For his last dinner, Joe Arity requested ice cream. The next day, January 6, 1939, having said goodbye to his mother, Joe wore a smile as he left for the gas chamber most likely not understanding what was happening. On the way, he gave away his favorite train to another prisoner. Joe Arity was buried in the prison cemetery on Woodpecker Hill and forgotten. Half a century later, in 1992, writer Robert Perksey discovered a poem by the warden in an old book dedicated to the unfairly executed convict. He became interested in the case and carried out his own investigation, telling the world Joe Arity's story in the book Deadly Innocence. The publicity led to the creation of the Friends of Joe Arity organization, which was started in order to clear his name. In January of 2011, 72 years after his execution, Arity was officially pardoned. Colorado Governor Bill Ritter publicly announced that Joe was unlawfully convicted. He emphasized that the death of a man with the mind and spirit of a child would forever be a tragic event in the history of the state. On Arity's headstone is installed a marble slab with a photograph. In the photo, Joe plays with his favorite train. Thus, one of the most dramatic miscarriages of justice went down in history. Why do you think that evidence and eyewitness testimony turned out to be weaker than the authority and persistence of the sheriff? What were the jurors thinking when they sentenced to death an innocent, mentally disabled 23-year-old with the soul of a child? Write your thoughts in the comments. Subscribe to our channel and give us a big thumbs up. See you in the next episode.